this is like the third part I would say about the book of Job as you know I just divided the uh, book of Job in sections so to make it easier for us to make it easier for us to um, understand it and for now something we have something totally different in this third section chapter 38 39 40 41 and 42 now what is something totally different well completely different because God enters the picture so far when we you know when we um, analyze this book we could always see that it was it was men with their carnal carnal musings let's call it that way uh, it was men with their carnal musing musings who uh, uh, came to see Job, supposedly his friends, and they were just kindly trying to figure out what was going on with Job and why. You know, so the book of Job, now from beginning in chapter 38, which is the beginning of that third section, 38, all the way through uh, chapter 42. Finally, beginning in chapter 38, God gives what is happening in the book of Job, and he gives it meaning and purpose. And it's no longer, you know, a seemingly random event, but we see it was a purposeful interaction. Because we, by our nature, brethren, we all know that we are not really very teachable, are we? Because we don't like to, li to listen. Come on, let's be honest. We don't really like to listen. We like to be the sole judge of our own thinking and behavior. And that attitude usually gets us into big troubles, of course. Because we live in our own heads and we deceive ourselves, as Jeremiah reminded us in Jeremiah 79, that the heart is deceitful above all things things and desperately wicked we find ourselves year after year sometimes running over the same old ground and being okay with it you know now human beings are also masters at rationalization you know like you know oh yes i i know i shouldn't do that but you know let me just explain once you've heard my story you'll understand why i do what i do and uh, i wonder if that was the key issue for the church in sardis that we read about in revelation chapter 3 the report in Revelation on Church of Sardis says, Church of Sardis, Revelation 3, verse 1, I know your deeds, that you are a reputation, you have a reputation that you are alive, but in reality, you are dead. In other words, you believe that you are doing what is right, but you are not listening, you are not growing, you are basking in a reputation of your own making. And then in verse 2, the angel said, Wake up then and strengthen that, Strengthen which what remains that was abs about to die, because I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Brethren, it's sins of omission. We do have sins of commission where we commit sin, and we have sins of commission, but we have sins when we know that we should do something right, but we don't do it. It's called sin of omission. So here, this church of Sardis had sins of omission. In other words, you're glossing over what you don't want to deal with and calling it good enough. <laughs> uh, we've, we, 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 we've had similar experiences with various people in various parts of the world, including Africa, you know, because they didn't want to change. You know, oh, they were just glossing over, they were just doing their own thing, and uh, they were just, you know, they would just always nod their heads, oh, yes, brother, yes, beloved brother, sure, this, that, and the other. Once you just leave them and turn your back, you know, everything is back to the old. And they also have something else in their own minds, how to achieve their own goals, and so on. And this is a, this is a lesson for us, a good lesson, a reminder, brethren, and that is that uh, uh, if we are not growing spiritually, we are dead and i wish it was not so but trials are the primary means of making us grow spiritually sadly that is that is simply simply the case that's simply the way the way it is i wish it was different but you all know like i do that it's not different so the primary means of making us grow are the trials Trials and even fasting, we might say, they always pull us out of our routines and make us teachable. Now, sometimes we need those, let's call them negative, negative, often jarring experiences of our life to get, you know, to get our attention. That's how God just draws attention to Him, to get us into a teachable frame of mind. Now, being uncomfortable is motivating to us, lacking something, or being in pain over something causes us to question and address our 
perceived self-sufficiency. You know, we begin to doubt, we begin to doubt our master of the universe status. Maybe we aren't God after all. We begin to look, we begin to look beyond ourselves for answers in this moment. We become actually teachable. Because trials, sadly, are of vital importance to us in the plan of God. The primary means God has to shape us into the people he wants us to be, to convert us, actually. Please go to James chapter 1, because it is not surprising that, that, James, that James begins his letter to God's people by saying in James chapter 1 and verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, it is the first thing that James touches upon in his letter. And it may seem kind of odd, an odd way to start a letter, but James knows it should be a primary concern to us. It's a critical part of the process of reconciliation to God, you see. That's the whole, actually, purpose of, of the book of Job. The book of Job gives us a perspective on this process so that we can better relate to what James is saying. So it's not a matter of, oh, is it fair what happened to Job? Oh, is it just? Why is this bad thing happening to such a good person? Uh, do I deserve it? Did Job deserve it? And, you know, the fact is, brethren, we need it. We need it. And we have seen in the middle section of this book of the book of Job, it's quite natural for humans to ask when faced a trial, what, what did I do? But at that point, we are not really very teachable because this is, that is a defensive position, if you wish. We are still trying to defend ourselves. The question at this point is rhetorical and we're not really listening. At some point, though, our trial stops us in our tracks, we run out of excuses, and we turn to and fully submit to God. And we then, th we then let God take us to where He wants us to be. Sometimes it's not about where we have been or what we have done, but you know where we are going, that's the point. Where God is taking us, as, as a hope of Israel, we can well relate to that. Where is God taking us? The next place we need to be in our relationship with God. This is, brethren, where Job was at. And too often, you know, we judge righteousness just on the surface. Do's and don'ts, you know. The rules are certainly important. I don't undermine, under, under, underestimate their, their importance. But, brethren, they're, they're the showy part of obedience, if we wish. Compared to what is really going on inside of us, that is the easy part, you know, just uh, outwardly keeping the commandments. But God looks on the heart. God is looking for something deeper. God is looking to change more than just behavior. God is looking to change who we are. And admittedly, that will change our behavior, but not because of our own willpower. But our behavior will change because of what we are becoming, you see, a repentant attitude brings about a change in our thinking. Our goal is to change the thinking behind the behavior so that the right behavior naturally flows from that. Too often we rely too much on the power of our own will, our own strength. You know, self-reliance, reliance on your will, that's the name of the game in our modern world. But, you know, that reliance on self, that has gotten us into trouble. Now, I appreciate where it comes from, but it emphasizes self-reliance and it can minimize the vast difference between God and man. Because God is not conflicted individual as we are. He is not fighting his own nature. We need God to help us replace our nature with, indeed, his nature with his mind that's why christ told us to abide in him remember in john 15 abide in me and i'll abide in you if we don't abide in christ if we don't have christ's mind then we just lose it now god is working on job's heart god is about to draw job into a closer relationship with him than he has ever been before job will develop an understanding about god that he never could have imagined the difference is between intellect and understanding. Now in Job, if you go to chapter 38, verse 1, we read, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you and you shall answer me. 
So God is turning the tables, you know. In uh, Job 13 and in the verse 3, uh, remember that Job wanted to argue his case with God. He wanted to reason with him. God is about to explain to him that you don't know what you ask. Our intellect only reveals our ignorance and hides what we do not know. God is preparing Job's mind for the understanding he is about to have revealed to him. Now verse 4 within Job 38, verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Verse 8. Or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors. When I said, this is for you, may come, but no farther. And here you, your proud waves must stop. Have you, verse 12, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? In other words, he's saying, God, God is saying, Job, what do you think that you know? You know nothing of these things, and yet you're trying to figure out life on your own. So God has created a teachable Job. He continues to ask Job about the creation and the ability to sustain it. He talks about the animal kingdom. God is explaining that there is much more going on here. The point being that Job lacks God's perspective. In chapters 40 and 41, the Lord talks about behemoth, and Leviathan to demonstrate that there are things that only God can control, brethren. God has a purpose beyond what we understand. There is more to the story than what you can physically see. Then finally, in Job 42, Job says he gets the point. Job 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides, count, hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, let me speak. You said, I'll question you and you shall answer me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see. My eyes see and uh, therefore, as a result, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, reading you know the book of Job before Passover and around the days of the days of atonement, which is a holiday just ahead of us, it's a especially appropriate, you see, because Job says in verse five in forty-two, verse five. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. He's saying, you know, I knew you intellectually, but now I understand you. I knew the physical, but now I see the spiritual. And four chapters of very descriptive language helped Job to see God in a new way. You know, Job now better sees himself in relationship to God. And so in verse 6, he says, Therefore I abhor and uh, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In other words, Job says, I hate who I am. 
he has gone beyond the physical to the to see the spiritual aspect uh, and uh, this is not a harsh god brethren this is a god who loves job so much that he wouldn't leave him where he was god was taking actually uh, job was helping job he help, was helping job to uh, to basically close the distance between him between his god so the, the distance between them would be closed and that was actually the basically or uh, uh that was basically the the, the, the meaning of these events behind this book God did not crush Job as his friends tried to do and as sometimes feel the need to do uh, you know they feel need that they can do things better than him and the point was not that uh, The point was not that he was trying to torture Job, Job, but again to bring Job into a closer relationship with him. You know, when we play God, we imagine how things ought to be, how the world ought to work. We push our own agendas. God is telling Job that only he has the power to deal with the forces that surround us. We cannot sustain life without God, brethren. We will surely die. We cannot begin to see things as God sees them. Our only hope is to rely on our Creator. When we look back on our lives, what you and I become will not be so much because of the plans we have made or the goals we have set, but what we, we will have become will be due to our response to our calling, our opportunities, mind the unavoidable adversity or will come our way now what will make us what will or perhaps what will make our response but what will make us is our response to the things outside of our control you know brethren the trials that will come our way they will come our way the book of job helps us to form a proper perspective in the end, a very loving God creates Job, creates, brings Job actually to new understanding of God's and to new understanding of Job's evil, no, not Job's evil, but Job's good relationship with God. Job develops a deeper sense of who and what he is. Even though he was righteous, he finds that at the core of his being, of his uh, being righteous, that the core of his being actually there is more work to be done in this physical life reconciliation will never be a state we have come that we have actually arrived at but it will always be you know a process we're committed we're committed to which is especially a very a key concept a key concept uh as a way of life it's a process of reconciliation we're committed to it's a key concept for second generation christians growing up with an un understanding of god it is okay an understanding of life of god yes but you know we keep a lot of laws we often don't really understand repentance in the way that someone coming to uh, that someone coming uh, coming to that understand, understands uh, later in life does you know and as we grow as we grow primarily through trials and tests we begin to see our very nature and its opposition to God we come to a deeper repentance. Baptism is only the beginning. The book of Job helps us to see, brethren, the perspectives, or at least the perspective 
uh, that leads us to a deeper repentance. The book of Job really, really concerns the process of repentance and the other connection to God, God's thing as beings. It's a message that we need to read over and over again as we vacillate between self-reliance and dependence on God as we go through seer, as we go through uh, as as we go through our conversion process. Now we are human, and we struggle with our limited perspective and the desire to have life on our own terms. We struggle to see our life from God's perspective and in the process we have been invited you know to a part in and uh, the book of Job helps us helps us to see Uh, this process of reconciliation it helps us to see our calling more clearly as well. Now, hopefully, brethren, I hope that this message, which I broke into three parts, will provide a backdrop for a different perspective of, on Job. As we have seen, there are a lot of perspectives as to what God is doing in Job's life, how he is working with Job. Sometimes, People look at the book as being about suffering. Sometimes it is a shout about uh, Job's self-righteousness. But to really understand what was eternal, what was the eternal doing with Job, we need to look at the structure with which this book was inspired to be written. There are probably other structures we could take and we could look at in the key in the book but looking at it into a uh, looking at it into in the three sections commodity uh, 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 in the three sections hopefully it helps you all see it in a different way you know you put the first section and the third section together, chapters one through three, and uh, and uh, then thirty-eight through forty-nine. So the first section and the third, if we put them together, it gives a consistent view of the Eternal's working with Job to bring him to a place where he is willing to understand the repentance. And he understands his relationship to God. Now, the Eternal gives Job an incredible gift, brethren. And that is to see who really, who really is, who he really is. Anyway, as somebody says, the most powerful, strongest thing ever. Indeed, and if you take the first section and the third section together, first section, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, it gives us a consistent view of the eternal working with Job to bring him to a place where he is willing to understand repentance and he understands his relationship to God. The Eternal gives Job an incredible gift and that is to see who he, God, really is. But you see in the middle section that we analyzed last Sabbath, the middle section, the inset of this book, you might say, what we see is the carnal mind trying to understand God and trying to understand what God is doing with humankind. 
and what we see is that the carnal mind cannot make that leap. The carnal mind brethren cannot evaluate. It can't understand how is God how is God working with humankind. But thankfully we now understand and thankfully I hope that the uh, perspective of the book of Job is far more positive now than being negative. God was being patient, God was being working with, with, with Job and God simply brought him to a higher level of relationship with him and brought him to a better place, to a higher level, so to comprehend who and what God is and to see who is the real source of all of God's blessings anyway. So the end of the, the end of the book is very positive, as it should be, but the fact that Job was willing to repent, repent in dust and ashes it's indeed uh, another idea, information, interesting as well, because it seems that it didn't take that too much for Job to learn the lesson. And uh, instead of having a set of human carnal babblings and human carnal ideas and philosophies about what God is doing, God showed to Job the purpose and the meaning anyway. So we can now understand and evaluate better and uh, hopefully we'll have a much brighter perspective, if you wish, on the book of Job.